one of the best stories that I ever heard of a parent discovering their child with porn and they walked in and, and there was this boy who was 12 and hadn't quite hit puberty. So he wasn't sexually developed. He was still very much a boy. And the mother walked over to him and she looked at the tablet and she just wrapped her arms around the boy and squeezed him and said, I love you so much. Welcome to the Sex Plus Christian Parents Podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Thomas. And here we are for part two of our conversation on pornography. In the last episode, we talked about a definition of pornography, its effect on us and on our kids, and what to do if this is currently a struggle for you. That's right. For this episode, we turn to our kids, picking up where we left off. So what happens if you catch your child watching pornography? Then how can we be proactive in both this conversation and in protecting our homes. We're glad you've joined us for this episode. Absolutely. All right, to start, we want to begin with Walt Mueller, who actually felt that he could have done a better job in responding to his child when they were caught in the act of looking at pornography. So I've lived through that, okay? And uh, just to be a little bit vulnerable, uh, in the moment I had not thought about that. Walt is referencing specifically pointing to God's grand design during the conversation. That was before we started our sexual integrity initiative. That was before smartphones were on the scene. Uh, that was, you know, before I was aware that kids were having access like they're having now, and I discovered this. And I thought I handled it calmly. I, I believe I handled it calmly. I didn't freak out, but I don't think I handled it well. And I think, yeah, I actually went back to that individual in my family and later on, I was so so haunted by how I thought I mishandled it that I actually apologized. And I you know, worked it out verbally and explained why I was apologizing. And that individual said, you know, oh, man, I'm not thinking about that. That wasn't a big deal at all. But I, I, I had to state that. So I didn't see it as an opportunity that needed to be continued to have good, healthy conversations about sex and sexuality. And I don't remember saying, I get it. And I think that is key, to become vulnerable as a parent and say, look, I get it, I get it. Been there, done that. I mean, eventually we had that conversation, but initially that was not the conversation. And I think we need to be vulnerable with our kids about these things and help them see, you know, been there, done that, so I get the attraction, but I also want you to understand what this can do to you based on what this has done to me. Let's return to the story Michael was telling us at the beginning of this episode. The story of a mother giving her son a huge embrace moments after catching him watching pornography. And he was already ashamed and he was already shaking and he was already thinking I'm going to get my butt kicked or grounded or God hates me or she's going to tell my youth minister and I'm going to be so embarrassed. You know, whatever those fears were, none of us expect kindness. None of us expect that sense of I see you at your worst or I see you in a way where you're not who you want to be. and where you're not truly living out who you really are, and I love you, and I move toward you. And as I do that, I'm gonna offer soothing. And as I do that, I want you to know that you're safe to be you, and that you're secure. As Michael continues to speak on what to do when you catch your child looking at pornography, he begins to discuss how our response can actually affect the way they view relationships. You might remember Michael mentioning in the last episode how pornography can negatively affect a child's attachment and the way that child operates within relationships moving forward. Listen as he dives more into the importance of healthy attachment. The answer to your question about what does a parent do, there are four S's that are the foundation of attachment. And Jay Stringer in his amazing book, Unwanted, Uh, unpacks this idea of attachment. But there's a secular psychiatrist named Dr. Dan Siegel, who is uh, the the inventor, if you will, of something called interpersonal neurobiology, which is a fancy way of saying that our nervous system gets wired from day one in all of our relationships. And if we have these four S's, 
that, are, that we will develop the capacity to attach and get our needs met. The first S is we need to be seen, seen, S-E-E-N. And when an infant is born, the, the parent, the caregiver looks in their eyes and that infant is only born with 50 to 60% of the active neurons in their brain of the 80 billion neurons that are there. And how do the remainder of those neurons come online? Through eye contact. There's this invisible arc between the parent and that infant that bing, 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 billions of neurons come online through that sense of being seen. And then as the child grows, wow, you're awesome with that wiffle ball bat. And you're so kind and thank you for feeding the puppy, you know, and we're seen in those ways. And it's like a parent uncovers the glory of a child. And then the child needs to be soothed as an infant when they're crying as a four-year-old when they fall off the tricycle, instead of saying, don't cry or I'll give you something to cry about, that child is held and shushed and they, they learn that they can soothe themselves then. And then safety, that sense of um, somebody has my back and my well-being and I'm not alone in the world and there's a place that I can go to be grounded and to be okay. And it's a picture of Psalm 4610, when God says, be still and know that I'm God. If a person, especially an infant and a child, has those four S's, being seen, soothed, and safe, they will develop what's called a secure attachment. And this is just my experience, but I believe the research would, would prove this out, that a, a child with a secure attachment, which is to say that they can move into relationship with another and it's okay to be them, whether they are seen in, on their best day or their worst day, and that they can get their needs for love and affection and acceptance met. And the research says that about 60% of American adults have a healthy attachment. And anybody in the world of therapy and mental health will tell you that the generation that's growing up is going to turn that on its head. So about 40% of adults in the next 10 to 20 years uh, will have a healthy attachment and 60% will have an insecure or an anxious attachment uh, or an outright avoidant attachment. So how we respond matters. It is crucial. The way our children experience their relationship with us creates patterns for the ways they will relate to people for the rest of their lives. New, healthier patterns can be learned, but it does have an effect. So true, Thomas. It's important to mention something else here. Our response is not only one that's psychological in its implications, but also theological how we speak of God in conversations around sex and consequently pornography can also have effects for the way they see both God and sex for the rest of their lives. We've shared previously that your voice as a parent has the most influence in your child's life. Your voice matters. Use it to point to the fact that while pornography is a distortion of God's good creation, God indeed created sex as a part of his good plan. Here's Walt talking about ways to do this very thing. So I think to have conversations at a young age about the goodness of sex and sexuality, to have conversations at a young age about, you know, in age-appropriate ways again, about what God's design is for sex and sexuality, you know, one man, one woman within the context of a covenantal lifelong monogamous marriage, um, and, and don't demonize sex and sexuality, but have the conversation that it's a good thing, and then talk about the way sex and sexuality have come undone through the fall. You know, you look at Genesis 3, 6, and and the enemy, Satan, uh, leading us astray, you know, and certainly with sexuality, you know, what did, what, did, what did the enemy say to our first parents? Did God really say? And I think our kids, we have to realize, our kids are going to ask that question. They're going to be asked that question when it comes to sex and sexuality. I am. You are. We all are as adults. So to be aware of that, know that the enemy wants to undo our sexuality, to give our kids the, the open door to come and talk to us when they see something that they may wonder about, and not to just totally freak out and lock them down and punish them, but to affirm them for saying, hey, you know, you saw it, let's talk about it. That's how they learn. And so you want to open the doors for that. You know, the other thing would be to pray that if they start to engage with things online that they shouldn't engage with, that they would get caught so that we would have 
the ability to deal with it and exercise a redemptive, restorative presence in their lives. A parent needs to think about what is the end goal? What is my end goal in mind? Here's Dina Alexander from last week's episode once again. Do I want my kids to be freaked out? Do I want them to be scared? Do I want them to, you know, have this amazing, beautiful picture of sexuality? And that is something that I have tried to talk with my kids is, okay, you know, you need to understand what that sex is amazing and beautiful, that it's not just what this porn industry is going to shove down your throat. And, and constantly have the conversation. Look, I, I'll just say this. I, I, I talked about when I was 12 and I first saw it. And I liked what I saw. Uh, and, and, you know, it used to, it used to really guilt me out that I liked what I saw, but then I realized I was made to like what I saw. Uh, it's just that I was indulging my eyes in ways that I shouldn't at that point in time. In our last episode, Michael Cusick shared his definition of pornography, which we found to be super helpful. Today, we want to talk about specific communication you can use with your kids about this topic. And sometimes it's important to simplify and communicate in a way that your kids will understand. Absolutely. Dina laid out a simple definition for pornography that we can use in conversation with them, beginning with one for younger kids, then one for teenagers. Now, we got to prepare you for this. This is going to include real conversation. So we want you to listen closely. But you know what? Listen, this might not be the exact way that you do it in your home, and that's okay. But still, listen to what she says, because I think that it can be important in shaping your own conversation in your home. For little kids, so I have I have two definitions, one that I use for little kids and one that I use for older kids. For little kids, keep it simple. You need to define pornography for your kids so that they're like, what are they talking about? Especially if it's like a big word. If they're five, six, and seven, yeah, you still need to talk about it, but they need a definition. And that definition can just be as simple as it's naked, it's pictures or videos of naked people. And then you want to follow that up with, of course, of if you see that, you need to come talk to me. Now for older kids, you want to build on that because I'm talking ages eight and up because I want kids to understand that it's not just naked people and sexual activity. There's another layer going on there. These are people being, these are typically women and men being exploited and that they're making money from this, that this is not art, that this is not an industry, you know, trying to enlighten us and educate us. I want my kids and I want your kids to know that this is about making money. I know when I talk to kids about pornography, and it's helpful to me, that in our culture right now, sexual trafficking, there seems to be a unified, you know, repulsive response to that, that that that's wrong. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to understand that's wrong. You know, in the in the mainstream culture, people are fighting sexual trafficking. Sexual trafficking is actually, you know, when you relate it to prostitution, it's very easy to draw a line between that and the Greek word pornea, which comes out in pornography. And we need to teach our kids that what they're seeing, whether it's video print or wherever, or they're making their, it's always trafficking, trafficking of oneself willingly or forced trafficking of someone uh, by someone else. As we've mentioned previously, study after study shows that the average age of first exposure to pornography is typically around 11 years old. It's also, not surprisingly, the same time at which most youth get their first smartphone. Yep, it's true. As parents, it is our responsibility to create an environment that protects our children as much as possible and as long as possible from the dangers of pornography. So... You can have every, now you want to have every conversation, right? You're going to have more than one conversation. Yes, you are going to put those filters on your computer. I look at those as filters on computers and phones as giving your kids a leg up in the world. I want my kids' brains to develop as much as possible before they're going to be exposed to something. Okay, real quick. We won't go into a ton of detail on filters in this podcast, but we will list some good options in the episode notes. Devices like Disney Circle or Koala can be really helpful or software like Covenant Eyes. For more info on those, be sure to check out our podcast notes. That helps them more. The the younger they are, the more easily they are addicted, not just to porn, but to drugs, alcohol. We all know that, right? Our brain, they're so malleable at that young age that we want them to get as far as they can. So I look at filters 
on computers as super important at the, you know, not just at, at the router level, but even at the device level. Phones are super hard to to filter because the technology changes so quick and there's no way to, to filter social media. So those are all important things to protect your home, right? The filtering, but none of that is, is as important as the conversations. We're going to be talking about these things so that our kids understand pornography, but also that they understand healthy sexuality. This is not a one-time conversation. I'm not saying this is every week you're going to talk about porn, but I'm saying every few months, check in, ask them. Your kids, you'll be amazed at what your kids have been exposed to. We recognize this could be a shock to you. Maybe there's a possibility you think that your child would never struggle with it or look at pornography. That's great. But you need to prepare them because a lot of times it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So having a plan for what they will do if they see it is important. Absolutely. Dina has some great thoughts on setting up something she calls a run plan for your kids. Check this out. Yeah. So as you're talking about you know, pornography with your kids as you're, you know, having those discussions. So the first thing you want to do is define pornography, which we already talked about. Then you want to help them develop a run plan. Okay. So this is a plan for when they're exposed. Part of this may be discussing, okay, where might we see it? Okay. That might happen at scout camp. It might happen on the bus. It might happen at your friend's house, your cousin's house, the neighbor's house. Okay. Now what should we do once we've seen it? So the first part of the run plan is to run away, to get out, to get out of the situation, you know, as quickly as possible. Now that is also something that you can role play with your kids. Um, it's something that you can kind of, because we want to help them have the words because they're going to be scared. They need to be able to identify what they're seeing. They need to recognize it and to get away from it, right? So they need to be able to go, hey, the second, like that's porn. I got to get out of here. This is important. The fact of the matter is you may not be there when your child is first exposed to pornography. And there is even a possibility that there will be pressure, peer pressure for him or her to respond a certain way in that moment. Dina mentioned how it can even be helpful to role play these situations with your kids, to ask them how they would respond if a friend showed them pornography and ways they can step out of that situation. Maybe this means giving you a call. Maybe it means walking away. This is up to you and your family to decide. You want to invest your child in it. So have them help decide what this run plan is. Okay, how are we going to get out of this situation? Is that moving to a different part of the bus? If it's at scout camp, is it changing tents that night? What is a way that we can do that without being totally embarrassed or, you know, feeling super uncomfortable? The second part is to understand what you've seen. Most kids are not going to understand what they've seen. Even middle schoolers don't really understand what's going on entirely in porn that first time they're exposed. So that understanding comes from talking with your parent or another trusted adult. So you need to be able to say to your kids and help them understand, you can come and talk to me about this. I'm not gonna get mad at you. I'm, you're not gonna get, I'm not gonna punish you, but we need to talk about this. So if you've seen something at school, if you've seen something, come talk to me about it. I'm gonna help you make sense of it. Now, the last part of the run plan is to never seek it out again. So talking to your kids and saying, what can we do to make sure we never see this? How can we protect ourselves if we're tempted to see this? You know, is there, who can we talk to? If you've maybe seen it, maybe you've seen porn a few times. You know, maybe your 12-year-old has seen porn several times and they're curious. They want to see it. That's normal. That's natural. But they still need to, to get away from it and to never seek it out again. So you want to, dis, you know, discuss those. And that's why, again, you can see how tough this, this is not. This plan is not something you talk about one time. Because a run plan when you're eight is very different than the run plan when you're 12 and when you're 16. Yeah, a lot of people, when they think about protecting their children from pornography, what they'll say is just just give me the best, the most latest technological filter that I can install on the internet to keep my kids from it. Now, I do believe that, you know, filters can be helpful, but ultimately, you want your kids out of a desire to bring honor and glory to Christ, uh, and, and you want yourself to become your own filter. Uh, as an act of worship, you just, you know, you're not going to put any immoral thing before your eyes, you know, as it says in the scriptures. 
Thanks again for listening to Sex Plus Christian Parents Podcast. We are so grateful for conversations like these that are happening in your home. They're not easy. Conversations around pornography need to happen, but we also know that being resourced is one of the most important things we can do as a ministry and as a podcast. That's right. Parents, what I want you to do is just take a deep breath and recognize that if this is overwhelming for you, it's okay. There is a lot here, but I want to encourage you, we both do, that you can do this well and you can take it step by step to have meaningful conversations around this topic. Such a great word. Well, from both Thomas and I, we wish you the best, and we are so grateful that you listened to this episode of Sex Plus Christian Parents Podcast. This podcast, this conversation, and all that comes with it can be helped by taking part in our Very Good Sex Talk, which we just released as a 10-video e-course, and it's free. Simply go to www.theverygoodsextalk.org and get signed up now. It's 10 videos covering a multitude of subjects, all while helping your children align their sexual lives with the Creator's plan. Again, it's www.theverygoodsextalk.org. Check it out. This podcast is brought to you by the wonderful people at Project 619. This episode was edited, produced, and sound designed by our very own Corey Crawford.